Uh, we in this time uh, we can uh, present another uh, professor, Majid Amini, is a professor in the philosophy department at Virginia State University. Uh, please welcome Professor Majid Amini. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Sure. Okay. Can I share a file? I'm just trying to see. OK. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I would like to start actually my talk. Hopefully I will keep actually within the time limits uh, with a happy uh, sort of note on on warfare. Uh, this might sound very strange, but I would like to start with a quote from uh, Francis Cornford. Uh, Francis Cornford actually was one of the sort of uh, preeminent scholars, uh, sort of British scholars of Greek and classical thought, uh, classical philosophy uh, in sort of turn of the 20th century. Uh, and in a way, he actually sort of captures the, uh, the essence of what transpired in the 19th century. Let me just read actually the, the quote. The words religion and philosophy perhaps uh, suggest to most people two distinct provinces of thought between which there is commonly held to be some sort of border warfare. So I would like to start actually from there because it seems as if there is a bit of actually uh, sort of uh, truth to this in the sense that this border uh, warfare is really actually giving us a lot of uh, friction, obviously, but a lot of room actually for progress and uh, new thoughts. One thing about 19th century, which is very actually important, is uh, the fact that intellectually is one of the most trying times for religion, at least in Europe, actually, that was the case. Uh, in some sense, actually, this was really the watershed in the history of religion, intellectually speaking. But at the same time, actually, uh, theologians were not really doing their job, so to speak. You have a very prominent 19th century philosopher, Christian philosopher, Frederick Schelling, a roommate of Hegel and a rival of Hegel, actually, that was almost actually sort of at the same status as Hegel. He laments in the 19th century that for the Christian theologians, their entire science has dissolved into itself into the so-called apologetics with which, however, they have not come to grips and they always begin again from the very beginning as proof that they haven't found the point where it could be tackled with success in our time. So theologians apparently, according to Schelling, were not really doing their job. And this particular work actually of Schelling is very interesting, the historical and critical introduction to philosophy of mythology, that he tries actually to offer uh, an inroad to the topic of theology in a different way, obviously through mythology. So that's a very interesting observation. But in the 19th century, uh, obviously there are these non-theologian religious thinkers that try to sort of keep the arc of religion afloat among these sort of turbulent sort of uh, oceans and try actually to restructure or to rebuild the religion in order to sort of face new milieus and mandates. Two exemplars are very actually, two cases are very interesting and that's why uh, the title of my paper, uh, uh, Normative uh, uh, moral normativity and theological ethics actually go back to this particular actually phenomena. The two exemplars that I have in mind are actually Fyodor Dostoevsky on the Orient, Oriental side of the Europe that actually tries to rebuild this arc of religion. And in his very famous book, The Brothers Kar Karamazov, he tries actually to do that by appealing to ethics. I mean, famously, he says that without uh, God, there is no virtue and everything is permit, uh, per, uh, per, uh, permitted. So here you see the, the Dostoevsky trying actually to resuscitate the, the body of religion through ethics. On the Occidental side of Europe, you come across Matthew Arnold, very influential 19th century English, actually, sort of essays, critic and writer, intellectual in his own right. He does the same thing and it's very interesting. Again, like Dostoevsky, he appeals to the concept of ethics in order to actually bring religion back to the point that he says morality is nothing that religion, the very concept of morality that religion is ethics heightened, enkindled, lit by 
lit up by feeling. In fact, Arnold audaciously argues that God is really a deeply moved way of saying conduct or righteousness. This is quite actually audacious uh, claim to make, saying that, look, to be honest, not only religion, but the central concept of religion, namely God in this case, actually is nothing other than ethics, conduct, righteousness. So now you see actually two intellectuals in Europe trying to resuscitate, trying to keep religion afloat uh, in terms of ethics. So the question actually, or the observation that you may have here is that it seems as if morality is being used as a way of rescuing religion. Though you may actually have a more positive uh, sort of attitude, think of, oh, religion coming to the rescue of morality. So if you would like to look at it that way, that's another possibility. But it seems as if Dostoevsky and uh, Matthew Arnold, both of them are looking at morality as a means of rescuing religion. Now, what is very interesting is that we have the same phenomenon actually happening now in the 21st century. And that's why the, I've actually chosen this topic. It seems as if, although it's not a mirror image of the 19th century, but nonetheless, it seems as if the same issues are coming up. Trying to rehabilitate religion, theological thinking, through actually theological ethics. That actually is the parallel here. And uh, as I'm sure most of you know, the Templeton Foundation has been very much responsible generously to fund so much money, millions of dollars actually to, uh, to support this project. Can we bring back actually religion under the umbrella of uh, theological ethics? So my concern actually is uh, whether this actually project or how this project can be successful or not. However, on the relationship between ethics and religion, I should say that this is not just about 19th century. We do have a scriptural sort of precedence going back a long time ago. So this is not a new idea with the 19th century. If we go back to the Semitic tradition, I'm just ignoring other traditions, you see that the divine command theory actually is first sort of emerges as part of the Semitic actually tradition. If you look at the book of Exodus, the concept of covenant, there, there you have explicitly the, the, the verse that commandments were written with the finger of God. Or if you look at the book of Proverbs, the poetical sort of, uh, uh, one of the poetical books of the Hebrew Testament, you have this character to, to called um, wisdom woman or lady wisdom. And it's very interesting. Apparently it's modeled on, on a goddess of the Egyptian culture, but whether, whatever the origin of that idea is, a wisdom woman, the speaker that is giving actually all these uh, uh, advices to the audience, it seems to be a personified call of conscience and measure of morality. So this is morality, so to speak, speaking in that actually book, the book of Proverbs. But there is a passage that is so actually interesting. When you look at the Exodus, Exodus is talking about God actually offering or making or sort of uh, presenting Moses with commandments. When you look at this particular passage from the Proverbs, it says something very interesting. The Lord created me at the beginning or me as the beginning. There are two ways of translating it, of his work. The first of his acts of long ago. Ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of earth. Being actually sort of trained in philosophy, so to speak, this is actually a very ontologically interesting idea. So according to Exodus, God is offering the commandments, but according to the Proverbs, the commandments of ethics or ethics itself personified in the character of wisdom woman actually was created by God. Now you can see that there are two different things happening here. So if you put them together, you see God in two acts vis-a-vis -vis divine command theory. God as the ground for normative ethics and God as the ground for meta ethics. So although this passage actually in the Proverbs may not prompt us to think about meta ethics, but it seems as if at least it gives us an intimation that oh, God can actually act as a and as an explanation or as a sort of ground for ethics from a meta ethical point of view. So the question actually at this moment is, before that actually going to that, obviously there is a, a sort of logical observation here. Is there an entailment relationship between these two ideas? God as the ground for normative ethics and God as the ground for meta ethics. So logically, actually, this is a very interesting idea to pursue the entailment relationship, but my focus actually is God 
can God ground morality? And obviously, as I mentioned just now, God is acting in two roles as offering uh, a set of values and as being the ground of values altogether. When we look at this question, can God ground morality? You can get sort of approach it from sort of two, uh, have two approaches and two perspectives. So I would like just to draw your attention to these two and then you see hopefully logically how they come together. You can approach actually the question, can God ground morality from the point of view of theological ethics as a set of moral values, basically a topic in normative ethics. Or you can look at theological ethics as a source of, as a source of moral values, a question in meta-ethics. So you can take either of these two approaches, as well as two perspectives. You can look at theological ethics from an internal point of view within the community of believers, or you can look at theological ethics from an external point of view without the community of believers in the sense that you stand outside and look at it actually in relationship to outsiders, the community of all. Not everybody belongs to that community. So if you put actually these two approaches and these two perspectives to, together, you get actually four possible combinations. Theological normative ethics from an internal perspective, theological meta-ethics from an internal perspective, theological normative ethics from an external perspective, and theological meta-ethics from an external perspective. So you have these four perspectives. Hopefully I would not run out of time. Then my actually sort of the rest of the paper, which is actually the crucial part of it, is to point out the issues that each of these headings actually produce, if we are going to have a viable theological, the, theological actually ethics. So that's the sort of the plan for the rest of the, for, for the rest of this talk that hopefully should take no more than uh, 10 minutes. Now, looking at theological ethics from an internal perspective, within the community of believers, you are looking at the theological ethics normatively. Two central concerns actually come up that are very serious for any theologian or any religious believer who would like actually to bring religion to the domain of normative ethics as a believer. The first one actually is the phenomenon of moral difference and disagreement among believers. This actually is very crucial and often than not, it's underplayed or underappreciated by religious people or theologians that this disagreement within the community actually points out towards some problem of consistency and authenticity. I should point out that having disagreement and difference in itself is not a problem. The problem actually here is that is the absence of relevant decision procedure to resolve such conflicts. This is where actually the difficulty starts. A lot of people, scientists do have actually uh, disagreements a lot, but often than not, you see a decision procedure of some sort. You may say that, look, even there, there may be occasions that there are no decision procedures. You are right. When it comes to some fundamental problems in physics or biology, basically there is really no clear decision procedure at this moment, later on maybe. But when it comes actually to the theological ethics, this is really a serious issue. The theologians or religious thinkers do not actually think about coming up with a decision procedure of how to resolve these conflicts, especially if you are actually sort of holding on to this idea, which almost most theologians who work in this field, who most religious thinkers, uh, religious philosophers who work in this field, they uphold this principle even implicitly, the doctrine of ethical conflict regulation, according, according to which moral requirements must be capable of authoritatively regulating ethical conflicts. Often than not, this is at the back of the mind of most thinkers working in the field. But when it comes actually to having a decision procedure, the idea is forgotten and nobody actually pays even lip service that needs this the issue needs to be addressed. There is an attendant issue here that I just mentioned I'm not going to, to focus on is the problem of moral dilemmas. Moral dilemmas is a problem for everyone. It's not just actually theologians or non-theologians doing ethics, but it becomes a far more serious actually problem for theological ethics. 
if we are going to have a successful theory there, the issue of moral dilemmas have to be resolved in one minute or, or another. And I come back to this uh, sort of problem in a different context. So that's the first uh, problem under the heading of normative ethics from internal perspective. The second problem is Abraham's sororities. I'm sure you remember that passage where Abraham pleads on behalf of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah that God should not actually destroy uh, uh, destroy those places. Uh, this is basically happening chapter 18 uh, verses 22 to 33. And uh, uh, in fact here uh, uh, Abraham says to God, look what if in the in Sodom you have 50 people who are really righteous? Is this right actually to destroy the whole city while 50 actually righteous people are living there? And God sort of responds and says that, oh, OK, if there are 50 people, if it's genuinely 50 people, I'll, I, I, I'll rethink my decision. And then uh, Abraham finds actually the beginning of a discussion and he says that, what about there are sort of 45? He starts a sorietist. This is actually one of the most famous sorietists that often than not is being neglected, but it's really very actually intellectually very interesting. So in this, case, in this way, Abraham actually challenges God. What if I have 30, if you have 35, if you have 20, 25? And then it gets actually to 10. And suddenly the discussion stops and the chapter moves on to something absolutely different. So it's very interesting. When it gets to 10, there is no uh, sort of ending. There is no sort of a clear uh, ending to the discussion. But what Abraham actually doing is here, he's basically engaging God in a sororities of highest ethical proportion. And so far as the text of Genesis is concerned, we don't get any actually clear response. However, what is the ethical significance here? The sororities that Abraham is raising basically shows the complexity and in intricacy of epistemology of making moral judgment. How do we make a moral judgment? Again, this is an issue that needs to be addressed. If, 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 uh, if somebody would like to come up with the theological sort of version of ethics, this is an issue that is absolutely unavoidable. How do we actually go about offering a theory of uh, 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 epistemology of making moral judgments? Going very quickly, looking at theological method ethics from an internal perspective. In the discussion between uh, Abraham and God, actually something very interesting happens. And I've called it Semitic because it's just coming from that particular text. It may actually apply to other cases as well. Semitic constitutive constraint on the nature of divinity. When Abraham is having this conversation with God, he makes this actually uh, a statement. Far be it from me to do such a thing, to, to sorry, far be it, uh, far, far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the, the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Shall not the judge of all earth do what is just? This statement, I'm not quite sure the authors of the Genesis, this particular uh, sort of sentence and verse, they realize that this is really putting a constitutive constraint on the nature of divinity. In other words, the implication is that there is an independence of a significant source of morality from God. Now you realize in the conversation about sororities, Abraham not only also looking at the destruction of innocent life, so to speak, but he also actually pushes God to the limit of, okay, is this with your nature to kill actually innocent people or not? And the way that Abraham is proposing it is an ontological constraint on the nature of God. And in fact, historically speaking, there are two sort of in terms of denominations, two sets of uh, sort of examples that I can mention very readily. The Karaites within the Jewish tradition and the Motazalites within the Muslim tradition. Both of these traditions heavily actually argue that if there is a God, this God has to conform to the principles of justice and fairness. Justice and fairness are independent of actually the nature of God. Even God has to conform uh, with that principle. So that's the meta-ethical aspect of it. Now, going to the theological normative ethics from external perspective, uh, I'm hoping that I'm not actually running out of my time. There are five sort of interrelated issues here. 
We are now looking at ethics from a normative point of view. So theology is offering normative ethics. Now we are looking from an external point of view, not within the community of believers, from the outsiders. The first problem is the problem of universality. How universal are the moral values emanating from a theological normative theory? The reason that I'm raising that this can be read in so many different ways, but the crucial point is actually the rival school of moral particularism. That needs to be sorted out, actually responded to by theological sort of ethicists that are we going to settle for universal morality or could moral particularists would say that, look, you are actually chasing the wrong, the wrong sort of creature. You are barking up the wrong tree. There is no possibility of universality. This is an issue that the theological ethicists have to actually face in a very substantial way. And in, in a way, the, what moral particularism is trying to say that, look, there is really no morality in principle terms. Just forget that. And this, generally speaking, doesn't go very well with the overall impression among theologians about ethics. The next problem is the problem of compatibility. How compatible are the moral values of theological normative system with non-theological moral values? At the end of the day, you end up with some people who are not going to subscribe to any sort of theology. Either they happen to be agnostic or atheist. How does the theological actually body of ethics conform, cohort, sort of transact with the non-theological one? Often than not, we don't get a clear answer actually on these issues. Problem of partiality. This is actually a problem that I've come across a lot in the sense that because of the concepts of chosen and favored people, the concept of partiality, that actually creates a huge problem of ethics for theologians. You cannot separate actually a segment of the people in virtue of some specific beliefs. Ethically, that doesn't seem as if to sit actually comfortably with the principles of ethics. So that needs to be addressed. Emergence of new moral values. Again, you don't really get actually a structure from theological ethicists that constantly the reaction or the approach is reactive rather than proactive. You just try your new uh, areas, new ideas, new values are coming up, and then you try to incorporate them, you try to accommodate them. It seems as if there is no proactive decision procedure structure for, okay, how we are supposed to deal with new values when they emerge? How does a theological, actually ethical structure deal with that? And lastly, under this rubric, the problem of incompleteness. I'm hoping that should remind you of the famous, actually, Gödel's incompleteness theorem. There is actually uh, an intention on my part that could somehow one argue that ethics may be in the same boat as mathematics, as there is no possibility of completeness to mathematics. Remind yourself of Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. There is the possibility that what if that issue happens here? If it happens, actually, it reflects very deeply on the nature of theological ethics, as well as the central character of the theological ethics, namely God. In other words, even God may not be able to perform the completeness of that task as well. So again, I'm just trying to draw this parallel. It's, it's a very serious sort of issue uh, for, 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 for ethics. And lastly, I think I'm within my sort of hopefully my limits of time. Theological metaethics from an external perspective. Here I have six scenarios that theological ethicists actually have to look at carefully. The very first one is a very famous one. I don't need to, th to say anything about it, Euthyphro dilemma. There are some sort of suggestions that this problem can be bypassed in one another, even if it can, but there are other issues involved here. The second scenario. Abraham Sorietas. I mentioned that earlier. There is another aspect of Abraham Sorietas, nothing to do with the other aspects that are raised in terms of normative ethics. In terms of metaethics, actually, there is this issue there. Historically speaking, the case of Sorietas have always been used by skeptics, ancient or contemporary skeptics, in order to push the case for skepticism epistemological skepticism, ontological skepticism, and basically destroying the foundation for any ontological, epistemological or ontological realisms or objectivist outlook. This is actually very interesting. If Abraham Sorites sort of holds water and we cannot respond to it in a proper way, 
the minimum actually uh, to the consequence is that forget about having a realist understanding of morality from the perspective of theology. Give that up completely. So that's the other aspect of the of the sororities that in itself as a tool is a harbinger of actually skepticism. Next problem of subjectivity. Can God know what it feels like to be a non divine moral agent? and thereby questioning the fairness or justice of God sitting in judgment on such moral agent. Given that acts of evil, acts of immorality are subjective acts, if we accept that, and given that God actually doesn't have that access to that subjectivity, in this case, I'm reminding you of Thomas Nagel, what it is like to be a bat, what it is like to be a sinner. If God doesn't have that access, how could he sit in judgment on me? I'm more than happy for a human to sit in judgment on me because that human feels actually the, the qualia, the phenomenal aspect of sinning. God doesn't. How could he actually sit in judgment? This actually has got a ramification which is connected to the paradox of the omnipotence. In other words, the paradox of sin. Can God actually commit sin? If yes, then this problem disappears. If no, then this problem becomes a double whammy, so to speak, a twice problem for us, not only for the issue of ethics, but also for the issue of actually omnipotence. Problem number four, God's command of moral values and omniscience. This may look like an internal problem, but it's an external problem in the sense that there is a very interesting passage in the Genesis where God actually expresses regret for creation. He sees the wickedness being spread by the humans, and then he says, I am really sorry for creating this humans, this universe. And he actually, the, the verse is good, I would like to wipe them out and start with clean slate. Now here, traditionally, we think that God is omniscient. Okay. Can regret and omniscience go together or not? This is really very interesting. When God actually introduces his moral commands about humans, humans that are going to sin in this way, and God has omniscience about the future, I'm supposing that very simple reading of, of omniscience. Doesn't that create a problem here? A tension between omniscience and regret. If regret wasn't there, this problem doesn't come up. But given that there is an explicit reference to it from an external point of view, this becomes a serious actual issue. Problem number five, God's existence and moral motivation. Can the existence of God provide motivation for acting morally? It's, it's very interesting. On a very simple point of view, a lot of us think that the very existence of God actually is sufficient to make us morally actually sort of uh, encourage us to, be, to become moral. Let's put it that way, very minimally. But it seems as if that may not be sufficient for moral motivation. Even if God exists, why should I follow his commands, so to speak? This actually, it shows itself in three different other ways. That's why actually I would like to point out that these three other versions are not directly really related to this, but they respond actually or correspond to this problem. The Socratic actually version of the Euthyphro dilemma. Euthyphro dilemma has got this problem actually with moral motivation as well. Usually the Kantian version, the categorical imperative, remember there you do it because it is the duty to be done, not because God said so. If it is dependent on God, then it becomes hypothetical imperative, not categorical. And for Kant, categorical imperative is the essence of ethics. Anything else is prudence. It's not morality. And lastly, the Humean version. Actually, I'm very much impressed by this one, actually, the naturalistic fallacy, the is and ought fallacy. The fact that God is, does it follow that I ought to obey him? Now you see that moral motivation seems as if it needs something other than the very existence of God. It pushes us to actually think about morality slightly differently. And my last actually observation is about moral luck. And I'm sure actually 
some of you have been sort of impressed by this problem started specifically by Bernard Williams and Thomas Nagel. Though Bernard Williams actually started the whole thing, but the whole idea of moral luck is made famous by, by Thomas Nagel, so to speak. They had a, a session in, the, in England on, in the Aristotelian Society summer uh, conference, and Bernard uh, Williams starts the talk. He is the main speaker, and he raises the, moral, the issue of moral luck. And then Thomas Nagel responds, but Thomas Nagel's paper became actually far more famous than Bernard Williams. But the whole point is that Moral, moral life actually is very much intertwined with moral luck. And as you know that Nagel himself thinks, thinks that moral luck is very much detrimental of the whole fabric of morality and it undermines the concept of the self altogether, the concept of free will. Whether we go that far or not, the question here is that if this is a genuine trait of the ethical life of humans about moral luck, how does the theological ethicist deal with this issue? Thank you very much, and I'm sorry if I bore you to death. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Amini, for your interesting speech. We open to the questions. If someone has some questions, please, you can do. Right now, <laughs> we have some uh, limits of time. <laughs> Okay, Professor, I have uh, a few questions about <laughs> an interesting thing you mentioned in your speech is about <laughs> the Dostoevsky. Very interesting point you mentioned in your speech. My question is, as you said, Dostoevsky brings the religions again. And the question is, what kind of religion Dostoevsky mentions is a kind of moral religions or ethic or more ethic religions? My impression actually is that I'm not a Dostoevsky scholar. So at this moment, I'm relying on my very lay person's reading of his work as, a, as an avid reader of Dostoevsky himself. Looking at Crime and Punishment, looking at Brothers Karamazov, the idiot, you feel as if actually, this is my understanding, that's why I actually started the, the talk. He feels as if uh, the, the spirit of uh, ethics and morality can only be filled in with actually a religious perspective. And for him, actually, the uh, sort of ethics is what holds society together. So he has a very interesting, actually, conception of what constitutes society. Unlike Mrs. Thatcher, that he didn't she didn't believe that there is a society, there is no such thing as society. No, Dostoevsky thinks that there is such a thing as society. And for him, actually, what puts the society, what binds the society together are the moral norms and values, the ethical, actually, behavior, so to speak. And in this respect, he, I mean, my impression is that he thinks that the only way to rescue that morality is through religion. Although what he is doing, he's rescuing religion through morality. But, but what he's doing, he's basically actually highlighting the significance of moral order to a functioning society. Thank you, Professor. Um, uh, Nicola, we, we not have more time, I think. My suggestion is we have the break time now, uh, 15 minutes, and right now and it's 16.30, we can start again. Can be? Your microphone, Nicola, please. Oh, yeah. No, okay. Yes, we, uh, well, we have to shorten, the, it will be 15 minutes of uh, coffee break now. We can start, we can go back at 16.30 and uh, I don't know, but uh, I see there is a question, maybe you want to talk during the coffee break, I'm sorry, yeah. but that was, uh, so I will see you in uh, 15 minutes, we can go back, so okay. 15 minutes uh, is going to be a shorter coffee break, thank okay. you, thank you Majid. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Would you like me to, sorry, just, uh, would you like me to come back actually, uh, uh, I'm just a bit unclear on that side. Beg your pardon? In in relationship to the to the to the question actually in the chat box, would you like me to come back to that when we come back after the, the break or? If you want to answer now, I don't know. It's 
Whatever you suggest, I'm, I'm at your disposal. Tell me what you would like to do. You would like to start that break now? That's fine by me. Maybe, you know, should start the break now. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> 